Through searchlights we can see in the dark. We are rockets pointed up at the stars. We are billions of beautiful hearts. sold us down the river too far. What about us? What about all the times you said you had the answers? What about us? What about all the broken happy ever afters? What about What about love? What about trust? What about us? We are problems that want to be solved. We are children that need to be loved. We were is enough How What about us What about all the times you said you had the answers What about us What about all the broken happy ever afters How What about us What about all the plans that ended in disaster What about Good morning, everyone. Everybody good today? Me too, me too. Hey, my name is Mike Kalap. i uh, one of the pastors here at Bridgepoint. I uh, serve in the area of uh, coaching and mentoring our pastors and directors and uh, up-and-coming leaders, uh, some who work for us and some who are, you know, in our church or in the community, uh, that, that sort of thing. So uh, I, I consider it a huge privilege uh, to j just have the opportunity to pour into these, these lives of, uh, of these uh, 
young racehorses that we have uh, working here on our staff. Um, I wanted to uh, just welcome downtown today, welcome Seminole and Clearwater. Let's give them a hand, all right? Awesome, awesome. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to kind of start off with something that can, because you don't, uh, you've never heard, most of you have never heard me preach before. And um, so in 2014, I uh, retired after 44 years of being a lead pastor. And uh, so I, I served 20 years as a church in West Palm Beach. And I served 24 years at a church in Los Angeles and uh, retired from, not from serving Jesus, but, you know, but from being a lead pastor. And so um, we moved here because our grandchildren uh, and our children lived here. And we've just, just loved, you know, that opportunity. But we did not know 17 years ago that uh, we would end up in the same place as the place where we had a huge health scare. So we were in Los Angeles, and we had never vacationed on our West Coast here in Florida. As I said, we'd been in West Palm for 20 years. I grew up in Miami. But uh, so my wife and I decided we'd do vacation over here. So we rented a condo over on uh, Reddington, and um, uh, we had just flown in, uh, got, got a rental, went over there. I'm unloading luggage, and I have a heart attack. I mean, boom, you know. So, um, uh, of course, I was hospitalized, and as, as they were doing the, uh, or wrapping up the angiogram, uh, the doctor said to me, and I'm still a little foggy, I don't know if he did this to really wake me up or what was going on, but anyway, he, he said to me, um, I have some really bad news, and I have some really good news. Which one do you want first? I said, well, I'm the kind of guy, I always like bad first, and let's go kind of wrap it up with the good, all right? So if, if, there's, if there's dark cloud hanging over my head, I want to go deal with it right now. I, I'm, I'm not a procrastinator when it comes to that stuff. So I said, give me the bad news. He said, here's the bad news. The bad news is you have nine major blockages in your heart, and he commenced to explain the percentages to me. And, um, I mean, some of those, I was like, and I'm still walking around. What's up with that, you know? So I said, how could there possibly be good news after that? He said, the good news actually is great news. The great news is you have zero heart damage. Even though you have all of that blockage. So he said, um, we're going we're gonna to take care of all that. So we were, we were able to go back to L.A. and, and, uh, and get the surgery and rec recover there and so forth. We had no idea that 17 years later we'd be living here. And, of course, I had no idea um, in 2014 when I retired that I would be preaching here this morning just a few miles away from where I had that nasty heart attack uh, 17 years ago. But I said all of that to say this. Um, I would have been very angry had I learned that I said to the doctor, kind of tell me what's going on. You've been in my heart, looked around. I'd like to know what's going on with me. And the doctor said, you're doing great. In other words, he, he would lie to me. Now, some of you might like to go to the doctor and be lied to, I don't care for that, all right? I mean, I'm, I just want a straight fire. Just give it to me. What is going on? And let's get in and get it, and get it fixed, okay? Let's get, let's get the fix going on. Here's the thing. One of the things that was so attractional to my wife and me about coming to Bridgepoint was that we knew, we experienced our pastor. Every time we were together, he would tell us the truth. The church is another place you don't want to go to and be lied to or just have things kind of skimmed over, you know? 
I mean, this is a place where you want people to just love you enough to tell you the truth. So as you listen to me preach today, I think just that context about how I'm wired up, you know, can help you and may take and may even take a little bit of the hard edge off of it if you feel like it's a hard edge, you know. Uh, part of my personality is that I can be blunt, like very blunt. Um, people who, who are like me don't mind that that much, but some people who are a little softer around the edges don't, don't care for blunt, you know. But some of what I'm going to say today may feel blunt. What I want it to be, though, is effective, and I want you to feel the passion that's, that's behind it, okay? So that's, that's what we're after. Um, we've been saying from the beginning that uh, you can find God in the music. And I want to tell you, so I'm, I'm preaching next weekend as well, so, <laughs> so you can decide after what you're doing next weekend, all right? <laughs> That'll be cool. So <laughs> maybe a little too much blunt today. We'll see. But... Um, so I had never heard, what about us? I mean, confession's good, and we're in church, right? So I'm just going to tell you, I had never heard, what about us? So when Tim talked to me about speaking uh, today and next, and next week, I sat down, of course, and listened to the music. And I'm, I'm looking for God in the music. And I thought that God ideas jumped right out of that song. And I'm going to kind of unpack that in just a few minutes but I, um, I, I didn't feel like that I had to sort of contort the lyrics or, you know, just kind of wonder, you know, what it is. I think the song tells us, tells us exactly who the us are. So it's an anthem for a special group of people. And actually, it's, it's a group of people who have all experienced the same thing, but it's all put them in, a, in kind of a different place. So who are they? Well, the song says that they are searchlights, but even though we can see in the dark. Remember that idea of being in the dark, okay? Because that's going to that's gonna matter in just a few minutes. Where rockets point up to, the, up to the stars. So something of value, something that has a potential trajectory and, uh, and great power. Rockets pointed up at the stars. <clears throat> we have dreams. These people have been treated like they have no dreams. They have no value. They have no life. They have no dreams. And that, that'll unpack in the, in the words as well. And then we are billions of beautiful hearts. And man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, that is so true. So all four of these ideas that are found inside of this song are essential to really understanding who are the us. When I first got here today, I, I talked to a few of our people who know this song, and I ask them, who are the us? Who are the us? And I, I mean, really, I, I got all kinds of different answers on that. You can Google that question, and you'll get a bunch of different answers on it. I actually don't think it's that hard if you just, if you just think about the words, all right? So why are they crying out? Why is this? Come on. And why won't you work? Okay? Okay. So here's, here's the heart of the song. These are people who have been told something that they believed and probably had reason to believe, but they were sold down the river. Because you said you had all the answers, so they had reason to believe someone who put themselves out there as having the answers to life's questions. You said you had all the answers, but you sold us down the river because you said that we'd live happily ever after. Sort of a fairy tale idea. So if you do this, this, and this, then you live happily ever after. But they did those things and are not living happily ever after. So their question is, what about us? In other words, why did that not work for us? Or maybe a deeper question, will that work for anybody? What about that? 
And what about us? So what went wrong? There's a disconnect with two missing things. And the first disconnect is love. And when, um, when we get to the text that I'm going to use this morning, uh, I, th- I think that the love connection idea will be pretty clear. And I actually think that a lot of us are going to feel this in a, in a, in a very deep way. Because believe me, and you know, right? When love is missing, we're in a lot of trouble. When we feel unloved, we're in a bad place. Trust. My wife is here this morning. When, when we were talking about getting married and in our, the early days of our marriage, um, she used to say to me all the time, you know, Mike, I could live with you if I don't love you, but I would never be able to live with you if I can't trust you. And trust is, is supposed to be a very high value, Right? I hope all of you are taking good care of that with the people who love you, the people who really care about you, that you're taking good care of this idea of trust. But they're missing, and I believe that that is what is disconnected, disconnected the us in this song and why they're crying. What about us? Okay? So the words continue. We are problems that want to be solved. Can I just say this? As I'm looking around this room today, you're not a problem that needs somebody to fix you or solve you. Okay? That's, that's not what... And God doesn't look at us as a problem that needs to be solved or fixed. We don't, we don't need that. We're people valued to God. We're people. We are children that need to be loved. And of course, I 100% agree with that. All right? So I'm, I want to read a text and I'm, gonna put, I'm just going to put it up, but I want to set it up before I read it. Okay? So here's the setup on this. This is from Luke chapter 4 and it is, is immediately following. So Jesus is about 30 years old now. It's immediately following his, his baptism and that 40 days of temptation that you, that you probably have read about, all right, or at least heard about. So he, uh, he finds himself wrapped up with that temptation, and he goes back to Nazareth where he was, where he was raised. And um, the day is a Saturday, could have been a Friday night, but it's Sabbath, and um, so he comes to Nazareth, where he had been reared, and as he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place. I hope that you're in the meeting place as much as you possibly can and look for opportunities to to work your schedule so you can be at the meeting place. Jesus considered that valuable. And when I'm reading the Bible and I see things like that, I'm like, hey, Mike, do you put the right emphasis on where you meet with God? Do you put the right, and it's not, of course, the best thing is this would be one of the places we meet with God, right? I met with him this morning when I first got up, and I I hope you have a time carved out for that as well. It's, I find it of highest value, really, highest value. So Jesus went to the meeting place, and when he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Um, just kind of an aside. So the, the, um, the synagogues had, had these scrolls. The wealthiest of the synagogues had all 76 or 78. It depends on which scholar you read. But 76, 77, or 78 scrolls. Today, those are reduced to 39 books in the, in the, uh, in the Old Testament for us. We would call that the Old Testament. The, it is believed that the synagogue where Jesus was raised there were only three scrolls. And the, the deduct on that is this, that in the ministry of Christ, he quoted a lot from the Old Testament, but he only quoted from Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. That was it. Is it possible that the Son of God was actually raised in a synagogue where there were only three 
books of the Old Testament? It is possible and is probable, actually, just considering that he never quoted from anything else. So anyway, and one more thing. So the prophet Isaiah is Messiah prediction rich. So it's where, it's where we get those promises and predictions or prophecies at Christmas that are, that are read. You know, virgin shall conceive, bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. That's Isaiah. But there's another prediction or prophecy. And he's getting ready to read it. So here it is. He unrolled the scroll. He found the place where it was written. God's Spirit, and this is Isaiah 61, if you're taking notes, you could read the whole context later. But God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. I'm going to come back on that. Sent me to announce pardon to prisoners. I'll be back on that as well. And recover the sight of the blind, that as well. To set the burdened and the battered free, that too. To announce this is God's year to act. Now let's take a few moments and unpack uh, unpack these ideas, okay? So, what is this message? It's the message of the good news. And who is it to? It is to the poor. Now, I would be shocked if there are not a number of people in this room today who are not, you are not financially poor. But if you be honest with yourself, you're relationally poor. You could be spiritually poor. You could have all the resources that anyone could, could need in a lifetime or two. Your children, your grandchildren are taken care of. But the wreckage in your rearview mirror, relationally, basically says, I'm poor. But it doesn't have anything to do with your, you know, your net worth. But it, you can still be poor, right? Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. So you can still be just bankrupt in other ways. That's a sad place to be, right? I have some friends who really have everything in the world you don't actually need and hardly anything in the world that you really, really need. So Jesus came... For the poor, whether it's money poor, spiritually poor, relationally poor, whatever that poverty is, okay, ever how much that poverty is, he came for us to the poor. He came to the prisoners. Now, in the day of Jesus, the Romans had basically conquered the world. They built like, like super, like we would call freeways or interstate roads all over their empire. They had brought, you know, their version of civilization, but pretty barbaric. Most scholars believe that in Rome during the days of Jesus, there were at least 100 million slaves let me say that again. 100 million slaves. At one time, the government considered making slaves wear a different kind of clothes so they could be recognized, but they realized if they did that, that the, the slaves would all realize how many there were of them, and they could probably overthrow the Roman Empire because there were so many of them. Slaves. They were everywhere, in every neighborhood. So children of slaves played with the children of the free. But the slaves were abused. Their life was terrible, terrible. Were they actually in jail? No, but they were prisoners. They were prisoners of their situation. So I want to say this morning, I want to say today to my friends, who are addicted. I want to say you might not be in jail, 
but you're in a prison. I want to say to my friends today who have made a decision to harbor and carry resentment, that is its own kind of jail. You know what resentment is, right? It would be me being angry with you, me drinking poison and expecting you to die. That's resentment. That is soul toxic. Prisoners. But Jesus came with the good news to the poor and to the prisoners. He came to the blind. <laughs> I was telling the first service. So when Nancy and I first got married, we have nothing, all right? I mean, we are, we are just typical young married couple. However, we had enough, we had enough money to buy Great Dane. Has anybody ever, ever tried to even feed a Great Dane? All right. I mean, you, need a, you actually need to go buy a truck. When you buy a Great Dane, you should go buy a truck so you can bring the bags of food home, all right? I mean, that dog was 180 pounds. <laughs> he was like a grown man down on all fours, you know. <laughs> big, big dog. So anyway, we lived in an apartment, a small one. <laughs> and um, so he lived in there with us. So over time, of course, when you have a beast like that living with you, you become nose blind. <laughs> so we would wonder why, why friends would come over to our house and walk in the front door and go, <laughs> what's that smell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> the truth is, Marcus was just Marcus, all right? He was just a dog, all right? So he smelled like a dog. We kept him clean. You know, we gave him mouthwash. I mean, he was, but he's just a dog, all right? So when you have a dog that's pinned up in a small apartment like that, it's actually a blessing to be nose blind, <laughs> but to us, okay? But there are many people, there are many people who are blind, but can see physically just fine, right? So they're okay that way but they're blind. What are they blind to? Well, maybe they're blind to that wreckage in the rearview mirror, that relational wreckage, maybe. Maybe they're, maybe they're blind to uh, their moral code. Their moral code is broken, and they're, they're totally blind to that. They think they're doing great. Um, just blind. Just blind. But the message of the good news came to give us sight so that can we, we could see ourselves as God sees us, as people who are loved. He came to set the broken and battered free. When I think of the word broken, I think all of us are broken some. We're broken some. Some of it was, you know, was done to us, and some of that brokenness was done by us, to us. There have been many times in my life when I've been just my own worst enemy, right? My own worst enemy. And the, the great news is that Jesus came to help all of us who've either been hurt and broken or battered by someone else or just by our own, own choices and terrible, terrible decisions. So I just want to ask you today, do any of these fit? Do any of these fit? So, what about us? Um, I want to tell you what I think is the, the most cruel and evil thing that is going on on the planet today. And it is Sunday, and it's going on today. I think one of the most evil things that's happening on planet earth today is would be pastors, priests, rabbis, other religious people who are telling people like you and me that you can good your way to God. That is a terrible lie that has eternal consequences that people believe 
and still have a hole in their heart, which would be shaped like Jesus, I might add. But they've been told to do this, this, and this, and to pile up good works because someday you'll be able to trade those good works, they say, for eternal life. When the facts are that only Jesus sacrifice his blood on the cross is the only thing that can wash away our sin that is it that is it it's not all of the good so there will be people who will go out into eternity and look back at religious leaders and say why did you tell me I believed you you were in a place of spiritual authority I believed you you said good works would take care of my life my eternal life. You lied to me. Why did you lie to me like that? What about us? What about those who were deceived by that? So I want to call you today to reject the idea. To reject the idea. Because that will do nothing but sell you down the river. That will do nothing but change that happily ever after. So, do you know Jesus today? That's the question. So, here's, um, here's what I'd like to do. So, some of, the, some of the guys I coached said, Hey, Mike, how are you going to end the message Sunday? I said, I'm going to do some public dreaming. That's what I want to do. So, I want to dream with you today. Because I want to I say, what would it mean... What would it mean to you if you are here today and you believed, you've been led to believe that you could actually good your way to God as opposed to simply putting your hope in Jesus? What would it mean to your family if you decided to trust Jesus today instead of yourself? What would it mean to what would it mean to your children or your grandchildren? What would it mean to your spouse? What would it mean? I'm just dreaming now. I'm just dreaming. What would it mean if when I hit the word prisoner and you felt that feeling inside of you that said, I'm not in jail, but I am in prison. I'm in the prison of fear, I'm in the prison of resentment. I have all of this toxic thought in my mind. What is wrong? What would happen? What would happen if you allowed yourself to be set free from that? And you decided to do that today. Wow. Would your life be different? Yes. What about the lives of the people all around you love you and trust you and care for you? Would their lives be different? Yes. Of course. Of course. What would happen if you look to God to begin to help you to become sighted in every way, in every way. That's my prayer for you today. And I'm asking God to help you to accept that good news, not put it off, not put it off, but trust Him today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, so I've, I've, been, I've been trying to preach this morning. I, um, I didn't know I'd ever do this again. And so my heart is full. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful today that Jesus came to this world to love us and help us to trust Him, to know Him. I want to thank you today that you can set my friends here today who are addicted to a toxic lifestyle, that you can set them free. I'm praying for my friends today who are suffering from fear. I'm praying for my friends today who are 
just poisoned with resentment. So God, be with them and help them to choose to be set free this day, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen.